Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. Today we've got another true crime story for you. And this one is a much sought after one. Well, it was requested, so I have been researching for the past few weeks, in fact, on this one. There's so much to get through and so many caveats to it. This is the case of Jeanette Tate. It's an unsolved disappearance case. Please remember to be respectful in the comments down below because we are talking about real people with real lives. Thank you so much and without further ado, let's get right into it. A blue chopper bicycle lay on its side, wheel still spinning, newspapers strewn about the scotch plaid basket in front. Two young girls looked down at their friend's bike with concern. It was a beautiful summer's day, Saturday afternoon, 19th of August 1978. But what was to follow was the beginning of the UK's longest running missing persons case. Jeanette Tate was born in Taunton, South West England on 5th of May 1965 to John and Sheila Tate. After her birth, they moved on to Cornwall for a brief time before settling in Devon. Jeanette's parents separated when she was young, but her dad soon remarried. Jeanette, or Ginny, as she was affectionately known to friends and family, went to live with her dad, new wife Violet and stepsister Tanya at a little town called Aylesbeer in Devon, which is located about eight miles east of Exeter. Aylesbeer itself was a small village consisting of one main road, a post office, pub, church and community hall. The population at the time was around 500, so you can imagine just what type of village Aylesbeer was. A handful of houses where pretty much everybody knew everybody else. It was the type of village where you blink and you miss it. Unfortunately, on that bright day in summer of 78, somebody didn't blink and they didn't miss Jeanette. Leading up to the Saturday 19th of August, Jeanette had been working the paper round. She was not the regular delivery person, but had agreed to take over from the paper boy for a week. The week passed without incident, however on her very last day, her and her family's lives were to change forever. The morning of the 19th of August began as normal. John Tate went out early to take his wife Violet into work at the hospital in Exeter. On his way home, he stopped off at the GP surgery as he was suffering from a sore throat. Afterwards, he returned home to Aylesbeer where he made sure the two girls, Jeanette and his 16-year-old stepdaughter Tanya, were up. He made them breakfast before taking Tanya to the coach station as she was going to visit her dad in Cornwall. John offered Jeanette to come with them, but she said she would rather not. John left his daughter sitting on the lawn with her puzzle books as he pulled away. He would never see his only daughter again. Sometime after 2pm, Jeanette picked up her blue chopper style bike and headed out of Barton Farm Cottage where she lived. She cycled along Withan Lane towards the A3052 Sidmouth to Exeter Road. She stopped at the White Horse Inn to collect the Express and Echo newspapers from the delivery van ready for delivering them. Heading back on herself, back up the way she came, up Withan Lane, she delivered the newspapers as she went. As it was the last day of the week, she would collect payment from customers on her way, storing the coins in her little purse. After Jeanette had delivered approximately 14 newspapers, she happened upon two friends, Tracy Pratt and Margaret Heavey. 
They were meandering along Withen Lane and stopped at the little bridge which slithered over the river. Jeanette dismounted her bike and pottered along with her friends. She pushed her bike up the slight incline as it was easier than pedalling uphill. After taking time out with her friends, Tracy and Maggie, for a few minutes, she really had to get on with her round. So Jeanette climbed back on the saddle and cycled off into the distance, leaving her friends reading one of the newspapers as they continued to meander. This was to be the last time Jeanette was seen. As short a time as just 10 minutes later, Tracy and Maggie walked round the bend in Withen Lane, only to find Jeanette's abandoned bicycle. Her newspapers lay around and even her purse full of customers' payments remained on her bike. No Jeanette though. The girls looked about themselves, looking left, looking right, up and down and looking crossways. No Jeanette. Where's Jeanette? They picked themselves up from a crouching position and began yelling for Jeanette. Jeanette, Jeanette, they yelled. They called out over and over and over, nothing. They searched and searched over the hedgerows, in bushes, over bushes, still no Jeanette. This was really odd. The girls had literally just been speaking to her 10 or 15 minutes ago. And now it was like she had vanished off the face of the earth. All that was left was her bike and whatever was left in her basket. They couldn't understand it. There was nowhere she could have gone in such a short space of time. Tracy and Maggie decided to check on Jeanette's house, with the latter riding the stricken bike. On the way back, they came across Jeanette's 16-year-old boyfriend, Tony Hammond, and the regular paperboy, John Bathard. Both boys joined in the search. When Maggie arrived at Jeanette's home, she was met by John Tate. She asked if Jeanette was home, which was met by bemusement by her father, as obviously Jeanette was out delivering the newspapers. When Maggie informed John that no, Jeanette was missing, he changed his mood to moderate concern. This was definitely out of the ordinary, but surely there'd be a logical explanation. Nevertheless, he put his shoes on and accompanied Maggie to Jeanette's last known location. They all continued to shout Jeanette's name, looking everywhere, but nowhere she was. As the evening drew in, Violet suggested they inform the police. John agreed. It was such a small village and there really wasn't many places she could have been. John went to Aylesbeer Police House and explained to PC Laws how her daughter had not been seen for several hours. From there, he was put through to the Exeter Police HQ. The police were quick to mobilise, unleashing their dogs to help in the search and a police helicopter which was fairly rare. Time was of the essence and they'd already lost precious hours. As details were released of Jeanette's disappearance, she was described as being boyish, five foot tall, brown hair with suntanned skin. She was wearing a white t-shirt with a high collar, brown trousers and white plimsolls. Over the next couple of days, the police investigation got underway. The father, John Tate, was routinely investigated and quickly ruled out. John was deemed to have an airtight alibi at 3.27pm, the time Jeanette went missing, give or take. He was in Exeter picking Violet up from work, after which they stopped off at a shop to collect a gift. This could therefore be verified by receipts and there were witnesses to prove that 
he was there at that time. John then took Violet to get ice cream and they sat and ate it. Before going home, they decided to visit Exeter Airport to watch the planes as there was a spot designated at this time. The subsequent police investigation was made up of three teams. The first was the search team whereby officers and constables etc would comb the area to find any clues. The second team was the suspect team. This involved investigators looking into obvious suspects in the area. They would identify possible suspects from a list of sex offenders, paedophiles and anyone with indecency charges against them. The third team in the investigation was the house to house inquiries team. Constables would knock every door in the area and get the occupants to fill out a form with their name etc and details of their movements on that Saturday afternoon. Forms would then be looked over back at the station to see if anything looked off. Unfortunately through all their in initial investigation and inquiries nothing stood out and no suspects were identified. The one thing I would question is the house to house inquiries. For this to be effective, you would be relying on the honesty of each and every person who filled out the forms, including the suspect. Personally, I'd say this was a flawed tactic because after all, you know, people lie and I'm sure back then they also lied and a suspect or the culprit, whoever it was that took her, was unlikely to tell the truth, you know. I personally think that was, yeah, it's definitely flawed. From the outset, there were a few theories as to what happened to Jeanette. She was taken against her will. This seemed a likely scenario, although it couldn't be established how a, such a thing could possibly happen in the space of around 10 minutes from the time she left her friends until the time they discovered her bike. Or she, she had been knocked off her bike and the driver panicked and took her somewhere to dispose of. Again, the time frame was a problem, but also there didn't appear to be any damage to her bike to suggest being hit. She ran away from home is a possibility. This was a theory which held some legs, of course. However, it didn't seem likely that she would ditch her bike in the middle of the lane with her purse full of money and also the savings she had at home. She didn't take any of it. In addition, Jeanette's father said she was happy and content at home and had no worries. This, however, turned out not to be true. When it emerged, he sexually abused both Jeanette and Tanya. I would suggest this lack of information given to the police from the outset could have hampered the initial investigation because otherwise they might have taken a closer look at him rather than looking elsewhere. She was abducted by aliens. Early suggestions by Tracy and Maggie were that her friend was taken by a UFO. This may sound quite extraordinary, but in fact the headline of the Express and Echo newspaper that Jeanette had been delivering that very day had been UF Autograph, an encounter of the Flying Dutchman kind. By all accounts, there had been a possible UFO sighting over Exeter, which turned out to be a plane landing at the airport. This will have been the very headline Tracy and Maggie were reading that day whilst they were meandering along Withen Lane. So it's understandable they would suggest this as a possible reason for Jeanette's disappearance if it's in their head that there's a, a UFO flying about, you know. With time fast running out and no solid leads, a breakthrough it seemed finally happened. The day after Jeanette vanished, a policeman's wife, Matilda Rogers, and her 14-year-old daughter, Gail, 
walked into the police incident room at the village community hall with a sighting. And this sighting was to become the main, if not sole, line of inquiry for years to come. On the day it happened, Matilda and Gail had been walking along Withen Lane and noticed the two girls, Tracy and Maggie. She even stopped to talk to them, asking if there were any local events in the area. Matilda and Gail were on holiday from Hull, so they wanted to know what was going on, if there was anything for them to do. They left the two girls and carried on towards the bungalow where they were staying, not too far away from that bridge that Tracy and Maggie had been standing at. Matilda recalled seeing a car heading along Withen Lane towards the Aylesbeer Centre. This was a huge breakthrough that the police had been waiting for. The way it was described, this car would have had to pass the two girls and eventually pass Jeanette. Matilda, seen as a credible witness, particularly as she was a policeman's wife, described it as a maroon coloured car, possibly a Triumph Dolomite or a 1300. The driver was a young man with dark hair. The decision was made, they needed to make this nationwide. If this man in the maroon car was simply passing through, they needed to search further than they'd been able to do so far. They alerted the national media and provided a photo fit of the driver of the car along with an extremely detailed description. The official police appeal of 28th of August 1978 read as follows. Aged 18 to 25, thick blackish hair cut short possibly parted to the left, pale complexion, thick blackish eyebrows, light coloured shirt with sleeves rolled up, a tidy appearance. The medium-sized saloon car was a deep maroon colour. It had a good shine and was well kept. The police also utilised the media to send out a rallying cry for volunteers to help search Woodbury Common. Incredibly, the turnout far exceeded anybody's wildest expectations as thousands descended upon upon the common to help in the search. The newspapers dubbed them Jeanette's Army. It was an amazing turnout, so heartwarming to know that so many cared. It was probably just as well then that they weren't told that the police based their search there on very little more than a hunch. Basically, they didn't have a clue. They just thought that she might be there maybe that was the biggest stretch of land and it was most likely place so they brought everyone there on a wild goose chase essentially the media outlets were all gathered on Withen Lane for a reconstruction of events the blue chopper bike was placed back in position on the ground this photograph became synonymous with the case However, it never was the original event, merely a reconstruction, because don't forget, the two girls moved the bike when they went to look for Jeanette, thus tampering with the original crime scene. The Express and Echo newspaper put forward a £1,000 reward to help find the girl who was delivering their newspapers at the time she disappeared. This was huge and greatly appreciated by the family. Meanwhile, Matilda Rogers underwent a round of hypnosis in an attempt to bring out any further details about the maroon car and driver. She managed to recite off partial registration plates which were run through the police databases. Unfortunately, nothing brought about a match for the elusive maroon car. Why were the police so focused on this car though? Police put so much weight 
upon the car because within lane was such a narrow one car lane. Two cars could not have been able to pass each other. So for one thing, that could have been the only car on the road at the time. Secondly, it was very unlikely that another car had approached Jeanette from the village end of the lane, grabbed her, turned around and driven back. There was simply no space for any car to perform that type of maneuver on the lane. It just made sense that this maroon car approached from the exeter end of the lane, grabbed Jeanette and carried on driving through the village. But still no leads despite all the publicity and appeals. Nobody came forward as the driver of this car to rule themselves in or out of the case. As time went by, the police became more desperate. In a move which would seem incredible today, they hired all sorts of spiritualists and clairvoyants. Many proclaimed to know exactly where Jeanette was and yet none provided a location. One such was Gerard Croisset. He took the police on an adventure to find where Jeanette was. However, on the trip, he managed to announce there would be a future murder, just not a thing about the existing one they were interested in. Another such spiritualist proved to be the undoing of John Tate, though. Robert Clackman was given access to the Tate family. He claimed that Jeanette had passed away and she told him that her father abused her. This may sound incredible. However, John Tate would actually admit to the police that he abused Jeanette when questioned about it. Even more bizarrely, John Tate has never faced any consequences for those actions and the police never revealed it at the time because they didn't want to lose public support in the search for Jeanette. It may have also swayed the public's minds over John's involvement in the disappearance. It seems that child abuse and child sex abuse was rife in the area of Devon and Aylesbury in the late 1970s. So this has caused some consternation as over why John Tate wasn't looked into further. For some reason, the police seemed adamant that John Tate had nothing to do with it and had an airtight alibi, which he, he did. I mean, he had his receipt and he was seen in Exeter, but he wasn't look, looked into any, any further than that. And I think some people may wonder why that was. As the years went on, the case became a cold one. Jeanette's memory was long gone and the village got on with life. No suspects were ever uncovered in the case, nor any evidence such as clothing, etc., which is very strange. You know, usually if there's a crime like that committed, there's something to suggest she was here at some point. She was here and... Or the clothing has been cast away or disposed of somewhere, but nothing anywhere. Very strange. No suspects, that is, until some 20 years or so later. A Scotsman by the name of Robert Black placed himself in the centre of the investigation. Or did the police place him in the centre of the investigation? That's the other question. Black was fast becoming the country's most notorious child killer. He was convicted of four murders in total as well as a number of sexual assault charges. His victims were five-year-old Caroline Hogg, nine-year-old Jennifer Cardi, 10-year-old Sarah Harper, and 11-year-old Susan Maxwell. These are his known victims, but he is suspected of more offenses. It is also seen that it's a possibility Robert Black was placed as a suspect because it was an unsolved case where a child is concerned and it must be remembered that not not all child sex murder cases are caused by Robert Black. During 
investigating his various murders, it came to light that Black had been in Exeter on that Saturday, 19th of August, 1978. He was a poster delivery driver, enabling him to move quickly and unnoticed between different areas of the country. Because of his need to keep fuel receipts for his job, it was determined he had purchased fuel from a station in Exeter on that day. A witness also recalls that Black had been sitting in his van staring at her five-year-old daughter. Black then drove off heading in the direction of Aylesbury. Whilst this appears to be compelling circumstantial evidence, there was no physical evidence to link him with Jeanette's disappearance. His van didn't match the maroon car that they had been looking for all those years. In fact, Robert Black's own red van was not spotted in Aylesbury whatsoever by any witness anywhere. And yet the police seemed convinced that he did it. Even John Tate wasn't convinced that Black was their man. Another man who was not convinced of Black's guilt in this case was Melvin Brady, who claimed to have actually met Jeanette's killer just 48 hours after her disappearance. He says he was in the Tucker's Arms in Downwood, some 20 miles east of Aylesbury when a man was up to no good. He said he was like a cat on a hot tin roof looking round. The man matched the police's description of the maroon car suspect. He was wearing a white shirt with rolled up sleeves, black trousers and brown shoes. According to Brady, the car was not a Triumph Dolomite but a chocolate coloured Alfa Romeo Spider which had been modified and had a vinyl roof, low wheels and low sump. He says he reported this to police two weeks after the disappearance. However, nobody followed up with him on his claims. Brady went to great lengths to identify witnesses and piece together a map of what he believes happened. He believes the man was a member of the armed forces, possibly a soldier based in Taunton, but undergoing training near Exeter. He believes this man was returning to his base in Taunton when he met him. He believes Jeanette was dumped in Woodbury Woods. Devon and Cornwall Police said the information Mr Brady has provided us with has not been able to assist the inquiry. Despite all this, prosecutors sought to charge Black with Jeanette's abduction and murder. They were just about ready to bring the case to trial when Black died suddenly of a heart attack in a Northern Ireland prison in 2016. Black had evaded justice on this occasion. Was he guilty or not though? Prosecutors sought approval to try him for Jeanette's murder after his death, but it was deemed not in the public's best interest to do so. Unfortunately, John Tate passed away in 2020 following illness and he never found out what happened to his daughter. Jeanette Tate remains officially a missing person with far more questions than answers. Did the maroon car ever exist? I'm inclined to believe so, although perhaps it could have been a different colour, red or brown perhaps. Matilda Rogers did say the car was like a Triumph, so it could have been something else. It could well have been the one that Melvin Brady identified, the Alfa Romeo Spider. Overall, it's a shame the car and driver were never identified, even just to rule them out. Or was there a second car on the lane that day? You know, that kind of arrived just after the maroon coloured car that maybe Matilda Rogers missed, perhaps. 
Some have suggested the two girls weren't as innocent as they made out. The story about the alien ab abduction. As mentioned, that was certainly the influence of the newspaper article from that day. That's what I would say anyway. It seems pretty obvious. Did Jeanette run away? Given what we now know about her father abusing her, it's still a possibility, although I feel unlikely. Some may ask why she didn't come forward to say she was alive. With time passing and seeing the distress caused to so many, it would be understandable why she wouldn't suddenly announce she's alive and well and living her best life. That said, I feel it's still fairly unlikely given the way her bike was found and the time it took her to vanish. There's also a secondary possibility along these lines in that was John Tate somehow involved due to his abuse of her. Was there something else there that needed looking into? Were the residents questioned sufficiently? This, I feel, was a massive oversight. If the police purely relied upon the honesty of potential culprits, telling them the truth about their movements that day, did they miss something? Were they told something that wasn't true? Was there something that they were missing? Were they purely cross-referencing a maroon car with the residents did and check and see if they had maroon cars because bear in mind it may not have been a maroon car or any car because it might have been someone on foot i know as unlikely as that sounds it could have been someone from town from the village who took her off the bike and just took her away into a house for example so were the right questions asked about the right things and one final thought well i've got a couple of final thoughts but perhaps the maroon car did exist but had nothing to do with anything perhaps it passed jeanette and somebody else took her which is basically what i just said about the about somebody maybe taking her on foot or something like that from the other end that nobody could see will we be forever wondering what just happened on that day in the summer of 78 well to date it has been 44 years and and counting it has been a long long hard toil i feel there's a lot more to uncover here as i said i've really looked into this the last few weeks and get got as much information as i can but i'm getting a sense that there's a bit more to it than i've even uncovered myself it's been like there's what is out in the public record and maybe what's not been told so i feel that overall that it's a really sad sad case any case where a child or anybody that just goes missing and is never seen again nobody gets closure and then the people who aren't even close to the family who have been put in so much effort into to to investigate in this they never get closure nobody gets closure because they want to know what's happened to the person and you may never ever know i find that's really sad the one thing that i can hope is that whatever happened to jeanette that day that she didn't suffer and that wherever she is now she is happy and just know that everybody over the last four decades has done everything in their power to try and find out what happened to her so what do you guys think do you think that anything that i've said has made any sense have you heard of this case before have you had any prior thoughts about it do you have any thoughts based on what i have put forward today and what's your what's your view on it what do you how do you feel 
let me know in the comments below i'd love to know and also if there's any other cases that you'd like me to cover in the future please let me know too and i'll see what i can do thank you all so much for joining me and come back again soon for another true crime special bye bye